So thank you very much. So um, for the people who were not here this morning, uh, I must say this is uh, slightly different uh, now. Uh, that's okay because basically we don't have to build on what we tried to do this morning. But just to uh, bring, uh, to respond a little bit quickly to uh, what um, Acacio was saying about negative probability, as uh, it's very easy to show that under conditions of arbitrage that you obtain negative probability. Uh, so. Do people try to interpret them? No. No. Negative probability, uh, I'm uh, not from physics, I'm from economics. Negative probability for us is really taboo. It's uh, something. Oh, well. Yeah, well, yes. But, okay, at least you can talk about Wigner and so on. But us, in our case, uh, that is, yeah. So, it's really taboo, this thing. Uh, <laughs> That's to, uh, <laughs> <so th laughs> to reflect the insults. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I want to present you is a little bit of a flavor of what we have worked on a little bit in the past, uh, Andre Krennikov and myself, um, in uh, trying to um, use a little bit this idea of uh, Bohmian mechanics. I'm so sorry. I mean, I know it's not popular interpretation of quantum mechanics at all, but uh, this is what we have tried to do over the years a little bit. So all what I will discuss here is in fact uh, not very, very new. Um, but uh, my concern here in this talk really will be with this idea of arbitrage, no arbitrage. And arbitrage, no arbitrage, as I discussed this morning, I'm very sorry, uh, I could, um, is very central in uh, economics and finance, because assuming that it exists, uh, the, 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 well, ex assuming that no arbitrage exists, is uh, really the, uh, providing you for a benchmark uh, model. Yeah, I mean, it's extremely difficult to develop models under the assumption that arbitrage exists. I mean, how, how are you going to how are you going to model that stuff? So, so it's very very central. So, no arbitrage basically means that you cannot realize risk-free profits. So, you assume in the development of a pricing model of any asset that uh, okay, you cannot make a risk-free profit, which of course in reality is absolutely not the case. But um, it's uh, something uh, which is very central in in a lot of. Um, um, uh, models in, in this area of uh, finance and economics. Um, <clears throat> so I want to briefly introduce a little bit uh, the idea of Bohmian mechanics and information. I mean, for those who don't know, but uh, maybe I don't have to do this Bohmian mechanics bit because all of you are physicists, so basically it's not... Uh, why should I... Uh, no? Because you all know yeah, Bohmian... Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, okay. Because I heard in Iran, in Iran, booming mechanics is common, is a, a common part of any physics course. Apparently, <laughs> it. it uh, uh huh. Uh huh. I see. Okay. And you were talking in Austria also, I think. Eh? Yes, but that's Rutgers University. Uh, Dür, Dür, okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, so let quickly, okay, okay. So I'll give a, a small application then of uh, this, uh, uh, of, of using wave function as information function as an information force, and, uh, and then uh, we'll t discuss a little bit this Newton-Bohm equation, and um, uh, I'll try to uh, connect it with uh, this uh, quite uh, very, f very, very central theorem in anything which we do in, in asset pricing, the no arbitrage theorem. And um, I'm not going to talk about application three, and so I will just leave it at this, and um, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit more about arbitrage in a different context. So okay, so let's uh, uh, go here. So Bohmian mechanics and information. For why why of course is a person in economics or finance can be interested in Bohmian mechanics because this is this idea, which is very appealing that you have a wave function which in being as a carrier of information, uh, steers some particles. So uh, this is a very, very neat uh, 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 very nice way of, of uh, maybe using, uh, it holds the promise of using this in, in, in a finance and economics environment. But you will be, of course, the judge to see if there's any, any really any reason uh, to do that. So. <coughs> 
So why booming mechanics? Because, uh, well, first of all, it's uh, an interpretation of quantum mechanics which is not very uh, popular. It's named after David Bohm, two central papers. This one here, very famous paper, 1952, which followed, by the way, very closely to the book David Bohm wrote on quantum theory, which has makes no mention at all about any of this. Uh, and, um, right. and then also, of course, this uh, related work with uh, David Bohm and, of course, his very close collaborator, uh, collaborator uh, Basil Hailey, and another work here. Um, where, and this is actually work where I think Feynman contributed a paper to, I think, in this one. Yes. In this one? Okay. Oh, it is. I see. Okay. Uh -huh, okay. So it can be traced back to uh, Louis de Breuil, who attributed two rules to the wave function, that it does not determine here the likely location of a particle, so, but also influences the location by exerting a force on the orbit. And um, it comes out of a book which you may have heard about, which is probably a little bit the Bible of Bohmian mechanics, but I'm not sure how well accepted it is within the Bohmian mechanics community. Uh, a book by Peter Holland, who is uh, in Oxford, on uh, quantum theory of motion. Um, so there's this idea of pilot wave. Uh, there's the idea this in Bohmian mechanics that the wave steers the particle, and I'll discuss it very quickly uh, in a few moments. And one can see that de Breuil uh, had a particle interpretation of quantum mechanics in mind. Uh, at, at, uh, when he was... Uh, and in fact, in some sense, the PHQ, the momentum relationship, it, uh, is also actually uh, reminiscent of that. So some salient features of Bohmian mechanics is, and okay, it provides for a so-called quantum theory of motion. That was what uh, Holland was saying. But this is maybe another quote here, which of maybe of interest, that Bohmian mechanics and classical mechanics share the fundamental concepts of real particles and trajectories. Okay. I don't know. Good. <clears throat> so how does it work? Basically, the, even for a guy like me, I can understand how it works. It's not very complicated at all. I look at the polar form of the wave function, so the amplitude function times the exponential function of i times the phase of the wave function. I put that into the Schrödinger equation, and then by using very simple steps, which I can understand, therefore you can understand, one obtains a very interesting term, which is this one. Uh, oi, 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 wait, yeah, this is it, right. Um, I don't know how. So here, right, so that is this polar form here, right, with the amplitude and the phase of the wave function, put into the Schrödinger equation, do a couple of operations which are really, really not difficult at all. Um, I have the steps here, but you can read the steps anywhere. And for instance, in Holland, he has the steps. And what you get then is once you do a couple of very simple operations, you get a very nice, uh, interesting result, which is this one here. This equation here, which gives you this the phase, the time, the mass. And then here you get this real potential, and then you get here this very special term which I think Bohmian mechanics people will call quantum potential. Right? And of course now the question becomes, what is interpretation of quantum potential? So of course lots of physicists uh, will have heavy discussion about it. Is this anything related to force or not? Uh, right, so, uh, so that's this animal there, which is quantum potential. You can see this, this quantum potential this, right, depends on, on this, this amplitude of, of, of that wave function. Right? <coughs> so let me go back. So that's how it is, so very simple. Oh, sorry, I wanted to, like this. Yes, yes, the other part is also, yes, the continuity equation also yeah. is there too. Which gives the interpretation of the, uh, yeah, but this one, I'm, I'm not interested in that one. So I'm interested in the, in the quantum potential coming out of that. That's true, you have two. Right, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that's, right, so, and we, we just had it here, 
right? And then we had this term here, which was this quantum potential. And um, um, okay, now is the interpretation of that, and um, I think we have to be very careful about this because in those slides. Uh, I quote highly, uh, sorry, Holland, who says that it is consistent to regard quantum potential on the same footing as the real potential in respect of particle motion. I do not know if, for instance, Basil Hailey would agree with this. With that, uh, with that, uh, with that remark, I'm not sure. So we have a quantum potential, and what one sees here is that if you uh, look at, at uh, the, uh, the, the lower on, on minus the, the, the gradient of, the, the, so what we what we know from from high school um, from high school uh, physics is is this. Right? In high school physics, we learned this. Right? But now, in the case of the quantum potential, we have actually this. Uh, the gradient of the sum of two potentials, the real potential and the quantum potential, which is the mass times the acceleration. So it's a, some sort of a Newton Bohm <laughs> equation. <coughs> Newtonian like, classical law of motion formulation, but with quantum potential. Newton Bohm Hailey equation. Okay, I don't know. Question mark. But anyhow, so that's uh, that certainly is what what would come out of of, of the theory um, uh, for sure. So the trajectory, right, linked to this, subject to initial conditions, uh, can be found, and one can see that clearly, this if Q goes to zero, you have the classical path. And uh, Basil Hailey in uh, the Oxford Conference of Quantum Interaction has an article which very clearly shows you how you recuperate the classical motion and so on. So it's uh, very clearly indicated also in that article. And you have an ensemble of trajectories when Q is not, uh, when, when the quantum potential is not negligible. And this is actually, okay, so it comes here, so in the Oxford. So that was one of the things uh, Basel was remarking here. We have found a way of talking about a particle with a simultaneous determined position and momentum even though we as observers do not know the value of one of these observables. Typically, actually, if you think about in, 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 in finance, in stochastic finance, well, you don't know position and momentum at the same time. You wouldn't. <coughs> so the quantum potential depends on the wave function. We have seen that, and itself, uh, the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. <coughs> So one can say that is the wave function uh, drives the particle, the pilot wave. Yeah? That's, that's the hallmark of uh, this, this booming mechanics uh, interpretation. And Bohm and Hailey in their paper in 1993 uh, compared pilot wave function to a radio wave, uh, steering a sort of a ship on automatic pilot, if you wish. And of course, one wants to think, or we would like to think, of this as a pilot wave as an information function which steers a price of an asset. This is kind of the idea. And I'll give you an example where I think you can use it um, in, in a few moments. <coughs> so let me give you an example where, well, first a very simple example that uh, Andre uh, discussed, uh, and we also discussed in, in our book, on, on uh, information force. A uh, simple example how we could use this quantum potential in finance and economics. Here, if you have this, this wave function and you have the quantum potential, right, which just is the way we derived it, we have it from Bohmian mechanics, and assume that you have an amplitude function which is given by this form here, and you have a force which you calculate on, force between quotes, you calculate on uh, this quantum potential, which happens to be this. And here, in this case here, we were assuming that we are within a price, within a finance or economics context. If you look here, if you look at this expression here, what you could say is this app reparates actually as a sort of a pricing rule because you could say that um, if you start out with a price level which is very, very small, then you could approximate, um, hold on, 
could approximate this form by this here. And you could see this, that if price is growing, uh, uh, the information force is more and more negative and the price uh, should stop uh, rising. You could start with another, uh, uh, with a higher price level here. Yeah, this, instead of starting with a low price level, you could say, well, what if we have a high price level? How could we approximate this function in here? And if you do that, you would just approximate it by this, and you would get just the opposite here, so that the higher the price goes, the less there's a negative effect of the information force. So this, you could use as a sort of a, 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 a sort of a pricing rule, if you wish, uh, but that's okay, fine. So what? I mean, you know, uh, that's maybe of any use, but okay, so what? Okay. Can I, can, can I ask a question? Sure. Which one is? Yes, here, but I'm here in the finance context here, right? So. So you're in a box. Um. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Now, at this point, of course, what have we done? Nothing. Okay. So let me now go a little bit further and maybe get a little bit closer to why we could rationalize maybe the use of this type of mechanics within finance. So at this point, I completely agree with you. Finally, we have not really shown that much at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think I don't want to spend too much time on how we could give interpretation to real potential, to mass, and things like that. We can all kind of translate this if we want to within finance context. I mean, maybe I should show it to you because, I mean, right, uh, actually kinetic energy this morning we already discussed in some sense. Um, but okay, just, um, this is also something uh, 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 Andre and uh, Olga did quite a while ago. Uh, here you have some references. I, I don't know if I'm going to have to give, give you all the references at the end of this talk here, actually, I must say. So you could have come up with the same kind of idea like in uh, high school physics, configuration space, sorry, of uh, prices, um, a uh, dynamics, which are time dependent, uh, price changes, uh, continuous price changes, Vs here, and a cross space. On uh, on um, configuration space and and the the, the space of, of uh, price changes is a phase space here, so you could do that also. That's th this is not really problematic at all. Mass, for instance, you could talk about uh, market capitalization of a trader. That's not a problem, I think. You could have financial energy in Hamiltonian age, uh, kinetic energy. We saw an example this morning. Uh, potential energy, for instance, you could come up with. I sorry. Uh, some, sorry, some example like this one here, right? Which gives, for instance, if this is a trader I and trader J, it gives you the interaction uh, between those two, two traders. I mean, there's a lot of other possibilities. So I don't see any big problem. There's, however, a big problem here with um, this here. And of course, it's that. Yeah? So anything which, of course, has any relationship with this Planck constant thing is, of course, I mean, obviously, you have to find some sort of it's very, very difficult to know what you can do with this in a macroscopic setting. Uh, is it some sort of price scaling parameter? Uh, should it be time dependent? Uh, that's, of course, another story. <coughs> right. Now, let me go back to get a little bit closer. Um, wait, sorry. Uh, And, uh -huh, okay, ah, yeah. mm, okay, uh, okay, we, okay, maybe we want to discuss this also. Before I, I give you something which is a little bit closer to finance, it may be useful to actually discuss very quickly this Newton-Bohm-Hiley uh, equation. 
um, from from a pad point of view what what the um, uh, characteristics are of it um, and I can tell you already right now uh, that's one of the problems uh, you would have if you were to want to use this for instance in finance uh, the um, characteristic of the path is not uh, exhibiting uh, non-zero quadratic variation so this is uh, right away a problem but that's not I mean it depends on the context you want to use it so um, for instance uh, let me just um, Uh, here, what I just want to quickly go on is that um, right. uh, no, it's not working here with this thing. Okay, here. So here is our, our um, right our high school version, but without right the high school version is without Q. And if we look at the uh, parts of this, they will not, and that's the problem here, that makes it right away very difficult to use actually within financial context. Um, you don't have this. And in fact, in order to have uh, this, you actually really, uh, uh, Andre and uh, Olga Shostova had to actually go through a lot of uh, nutcracking activities in order to show how you actually could come to it. Um, and in fact, one of the solutions was uh, to make uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the mass parameter here, which is emission of shares in our financial context, to be actually dependent on some random factor. So this would have to be um, random and, uh, and also zero at some times, which is in fact not such a problem. But I mean, it's, if, if you are from a financial environment and you look at uh, a trajectory like this, it's something, it's a property you would like to have, uh, this property of uh, zero quadratic variation. And this uh, does not exist unless you have this, which is okay, but uh, which certainly needs a little bit more work. Now, what I will do now is actually discuss um, how we want to get closer to this Bowman ID from a finance perspective, stepping away from those uh, pricing rules, which, okay, it's a little bit ad hoc, but uh, maybe get a little bit closer, um, hopefully. Maybe you will be convinced, maybe you will not be convinced, uh, and, and see what, um, how we can do that, how we can get a little bit closer to the, the Bowman ID, still using uh, the PAT ID also, by the way, without having to worry about this non-zero quadratic variation. So um, for this, I have to give you a little bit of background on uh, this thing which is called no arbitrage theorem. The reason why I'm so interested in this no arbitrage theorem is because within f uh, finance and economics, uh, from finance and economics point of view, this is central theorem. I mean, really, uh, <laughs> so if you can stick something in from, say, for instance, the Bowman mechanics point of view in this theorem, then that, that can be giving, maybe, you can give you something, some mileage, maybe. Maybe. But again, again, you will be the judge of this. Um, and okay, this has been published, of course, well before. So this has been around for quite some years now. So this, there's nothing really new about it. So I already told you this morning what no arbitrage was. So we're not going to discuss it again. But you can also formalize it. Yeah? Um, and the formalization is not so difficult. Um, okay. So formalization, uh, let me just see, maybe I can... So, okay, uh, s s the, the, the simple idea is this. Um, oh, let me just see. Um, what would we do? Uh, let's say P, say, no, no, let them, uh, okay, let's call this P, let's call this P, P prime and P double prime. I mean, there are, those are not derivatives, they're just different prices, three assets, okay? And they are assets, right? or oh, no, let me call it PA, PB, and PC. Let's call it like that, okay? And that's, uh, what, what is this? This is three times one, so we want, say, S1 here, and S2 here. I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what is what here. And then here, um, that's a state of nature. One. And let's call this a state of nature. Uh -oh.
state of nature uh, too. Allez. Right, and say for instance, so, so those are the prices of three assets, say here, and right, and we just put this in a very simple, okay, so this is a vector of three times one, right, and we have uh, payoffs. And say for instance that we have payoff here, uh, which is a guaranteed, say a guaranteed payoff, um, no matter what state. So states of nature are just like, for instance, uh, if the economy goes up or down. Okay, so economy goes up, that's one state of nature. Economy goes down, there's another state of nature. And here what we say is the payoff of this first asset is the same no matter what happens uh, in the state of nature. And then here uh, we say, uh, okay, so PB can take on a certain price, uh, PB prime T plus one, right? Or PB double prime T plus one, right? So maybe if the economies go well, it will be, right? So this is say time T now, and this is the future, and then the same thing for PC, right? Right, uh, two different prices depending on how, right, uh, the world pans out. Of course, you can extend this as much as you as, as as much as you wish, but okay, let's do it in this way now. And so, there's no arbitrage theorem for this very simple setting here. It tells you this that if you get those guys here, those are in fact we call those in economics uh, state prices. They're sort of insurance price. S1 is a state price, S2 is a state price. But it also has very particular interpretation here. Because if I normalize this, and I say PA is equal to 1, then actually I can say that 1 plus R of S1 plus 1 plus R times S2 is indeed equal to 1. Right? But um, what I could do is I could say, okay, if the no arbitrage theorem tells you that if those guys, if I can find positive state, they have to be positive. If those things, and this actually goes back to negative probability, you will see. If those guys are positive, if I can find positive S1 and S2, which solve that system of equation, then I actually have no arbitrage and vice versa. Now, if I normalize this to one, I can actually say, well, if S1 and S2 are positive, and this is the interest rate, risk-free interest rate, if I assume this to be also positive, then I could declare this as a probability. So I declare this to be probability, say, P1 tilde, and I declare this one to P2 tilde. So P1 tilde plus P2 tilde, they add up to 1 in this case. Okay, so they are declared to be probabilities. Funny part with this is that if you apply this no arbitrage theorem, what you see is that you can discount, for instance, something which is risky using those probabilities, with a risk-free rate. And that comes back to what we were discussing this morning. And what uh, Sandro knows about is that actually you are reverting back to what, what we try to call risk neutral, the risk neutral world, as much as we c can, to separate ourselves as much as we can from uh, preferences for risk. So, of course, this is not uh, completely untrue in reality, but this is the probability you will get if you do that. And the probability in this case is in some sense meaningless. It's, it doesn't stand for uh, anything uh, meaningful. Yeah, because you cannot discount anything risky at a risk-free rate. That is completely counterintuitive. You can only do it because you use those types of probabilities. Now, the idea here, what we want to do, is to show... Hold on. Sorry. So basically, this is all what we have here. So this is just this business there. So right? it's the proof of the theorem is very uh, well known. It's actually application of Hahn-Banach separation theorem, and you can find it in any good book. Um, like if if you um, uh, the book by Daryl Duffy, for instance, right? Duffy, who is a Stanford professor. The very first, the very beginning of his book, Dynamic Asset Pricing Theory, gets you, gives you the proof of that theorem. That's also to show you how important this thing is in finance. So. <clears throat> well, here it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, <laughs> you can also look at this book by Alison Etheridge, which is also very useful if you've never seen this before. 
Okay, so this is what we get. So basically, to re repeat what we get here, is basically you see um, that uh, you declare this to be probabilities, very, very strange probabilities, but they are all ending up uh, to uh, equal to, uh, sorry, they all end up uh, to sum to one. Um, and they are positive valued because the state prices have to be positive valued in case of no arbitrage. So those S's have to be positive and the R's are by default uh, positive. And then in that case you can show very quickly that the uh, a, a risky asset can be discounted at a risk-free rate. And so this, this, this here, this bit here between those square brackets is nothing else than the expected value of the stock which is just weighted by those very, very strange probabilities. So the idea here now is that um, if I have information which is contained in this uh, wave function here, and I change, and of course here I get my probabilities out of that, and if I change the information in uh, that wave function here, then it's actually what I like to s believe is that this is actually equivalent on changing the state prices. So, um, so if I assume that the probabilities with the tilde sign can be drawn from those probabilities represented by the square of the norm of the wave function, and I change the information in that wave function, then basically that could be seen under certain restraining conditions. This could be seen as um, changing actually, or being equivalent as changing uh, the state uh, prices. So we would have a very natural device here, very simple device. It's not Bowman mechanics at this point at all, actually, in some sense, but uh, I'll get to it. A uh, very natural device by which we can show that information can pot potentially trigger uh, arbitrage. Now, <coughs> uh, look at, at this situation now, because now I want to get to this kind of idea of a part here. If you look here at uh, those are those stock prices, um, and here, those are the values of, this is the stock price at time t, this is, those is, this is stock price at time t plus one, stock price at time t plus two, uh, sorry, uh, stock price at time t plus one, again, all at t plus one, but they're different states of nature. So you have state of nature one, state of nature two, state of nature k. What you can show is that, and it's not very difficult here, is that you can show that uh, actually the, um, state prices, those guys here, actually can act as insurance prices. So basically you can say I pay S1 to get 1 as an outcome if state 1 occurs. I pay uh, S2 to get 1 if state 2 occurs. And I pay that sum to get 1 whatever happens uh, in, in each state. So the interesting thing here is um, that uh, I think you can actually use the analogy of uh, the Bohmian path to describe, again, the variation of information here in the way we just described, to get a different set of state prices which follow according to a path which is actually unobserved, because the state prices, those guys, are not observed. Right? Right? And so that's kind of one possible application. Uh, of that time-dependent smooth path. So you could claim that there exists a time-dependent smooth insurance price trajectory which would be traced out by this uh, newton bohm hardy equation. Of course, we, can, we are just uh, proposing this. This would be a tool which we could use, right? Uh, we have no proof for it, but I'm, we are saying that this is something which could, we could use. Right? This, uh, I'm not claiming that we have any proof for that, and anyhow, you don't have a proof for it because those state prices are not observed. Um, <clears throat> right. Now, uh, let me just see. Right. Now, the next thing I want to do is because I have said several times that uh, this, uh, this uh, wave function is a carrier of information, and I'd like to know or sh give you an example of what type of information, for instance, this wave function uh, could uh, carry. And let me just see. Where did I put this now? Um, ah, here, yeah. <coughs> okay, wait. Here's an example of uh, um, the 
Hesbach paradox, which we've been discussing uh, many, many times uh, during uh, our stay here. But let me just quickly repeat again, and I think Sandro already talked about it uh, in, the question, in the discussion session uh, today. So this Ellsberg paradox here, basically you go over a set of balls. You have red balls, a known amount of them, blue and green balls, but you have an unknown amount of them. And you have four gambles. Uh, so you get one dollar if you draw red, uh, second gamble one if you draw blue, uh, one if you draw red or green, right? and one if you draw uh, blue or green. And what one observes is um, that uh, lots of people will take uh, G1 over G2, uh, because you know the amount of reds, and a lot will take also G4 over G3, uh, because you know the amount of blues or greens, uh, but you don't know the others. Now, the argument here we want to make is, um, if I say there's this preference relation here, if I say the price of a red security should be in excess of the price of a blue security, if I make this argument that the money gain is reflected in the utility gain expressed by that preference, which is not unreasonable, I think, then what you can easily observe is that if you group, um, so if you draw, if you first of all, if you convert the balls, the red, blue, and green balls into red, blue, and green securities, this, uh, financial assets, if you then assume that the money gain is reflected in the utility gain, then basically what you could say is that those two gambles could conform to one market and those two gambles could conform to another market. Uh, so uh, what you have is that given this, uh, the price of the red security should be in excess of the price of the blue security and the opposite occurs here. Uh, because G4 is preferred over G3, so you draw blue or green as opposed to red or green. Uh, so you would have the opposite effect. So if you now group those two gambles, G1 and two G2 in one market, and G4 and G3 in another market, then basically you could easily make an arbitrage uh, opportunity. Uh, so you would buy red in market Y and simultaneously uh, sell red uh, in market X. Yeah? And that would give you definitely a guaranteed arbitrage opportunity. <coughs> um, it's now not difficult that if you use again this apparatus, uh, the very, <laughs> very bottom line type of apparatus of the wave function here, that you can have actually a very precise piece of information stuck into this psi. Because if I know exactly the division of blue and green securities, then in this case, the arbitrage opportunity completely dissipates. Right? So an ob a divergence from this objective information uh, will immediately uh, trigger arbitrage. So I can actually pinpoint a very precise piece of information in this uh, psi within this context. At least that's the claim uh, I make. It's, yeah, it just, yes. Typically in a financial market, you exclude the possibility of having the arbitrage opportunity. Yes. You exclude those transactions that lead to arbitrage opportunity. I mean, there is really not, it's not really an enormous, there's not really an enormous conclusion. It's just saying, okay, well, you can pinpoint a specific piece of information with it in this context, and that's it. There's nothing more at this point. Uh, I would be lying if I were to tell you that we can do other things with it because we haven't looked at that yet. So, uh, if at all. If at all. Uh, it seems very interesting. Yeah. Typically, one excludes some, some possibilities. Yeah. We know that really. Yeah. You know, probably a real market can, in some cases, uh, exploit arbitrage opportunities. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, Oh. oh, no, sorry. Typically, in a real market, one can, in some cases, exploit uh, arbitrage opportunities, no? So this, the absence of these opportunities is also associated with an ideal market. Uh, 
Yes, uh, well, yes, that's absolutely right. So the absence of the arbitrage is associated with an ideal market. So real markets have arbitrage. But from a pricing point of view or from a modeling point of view, you want to assume it does not exist. And because otherwise you get into the situation which we briefly discussed this morning. For instance, within option pricing, if you assume that there's no arbitrage, you will have an interval of option prices, which is not so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> right. So let me show you another example of, again, going back to this arbitrage ID, um, which I think is also beautiful, which is often, unfortunately, not quoted at all, but which links up with uh, the idea of, uh, uh, the, uh, of, of an action functional. So I'm stepping out now completely of Bowman mechanics, but I'm going back again to this idea of no arbitrage, uh, but connecting it with uh, uh, the concept of action functional. Now I have to find it back. Uh, where is this thing? Ah, oh, here it is, of course. Right. And um, and this is based on work by uh, this gentleman here, um, Kirillinsky, who wrote a very beautiful book. Uh, now the problem is I forgot the title of the book. Um, oh yeah, it's, I know. It's uh, called Physics of Finance, which was published in 2001. And he is actually a physicist uh, who is now working for the industry. And he came out with a very, very nice uh, idea of modeling arbitrage uh, and connecting it with uh, action functional, which I really like a lot. Uh, I'm stepping out completely of this Bowman mechanics thing at this point now. So, but I'll give you another interpretation of this arbitrage and link it up with the physics concept. So here's a very simple way of thinking about another arbitrage opportunity. You think about uh, cash you have, right? You can put it, uh, I mean, one way to do, if, say for instance you want to, uh, you have cash and you want to buy shares, but you want to also make money. Okay, great, all of us want to do that, no problem. So we put, uh, one way uh, Ilinsky is proposing is that you could put cash in the bank, eh, get a risk-free rate of return on the amount of money in the next instant of time, retrieve that amount of money compounded, and then buy the shares. Right? So what you then get is a situation like this. Yeah? So you get those amounts of shares. Right? So this is the amount of money carried forward in the future of your cash. Then, then you buy um, a share in the future, i plus 1, which is of a value s. And then the ratio gives you the amount of shares in the future. So that's one way you can do this. OK. Sure, there's another way you can do it, and you can say, well, I'll buy the shares now, and hold on to it. So you could say, well, um, okay, sorry. You could do this, right? so you hold on to your shares, right, and then, so this is, uh, right, so you buy your shares here at price SI, that's right now, right, you get, those, this is the return here on the shares now, R1, right? and the ratio is going to give you the amount of shares you get at the end, Ti in the future, Ti plus 1 in the future. So as you would uh, naturally think, and I think that's not unreasonable, what happens if those two ratios are not the same? Hmm? So then indeed you can write this, right, this <laughs> very simply, of course, in this way. So if you say, well, this is bigger than 1, that's for the case here, or this case, right? Then indeed you could say, it's reasonable, I think, you would have an arbitrage opportunity. So if you uh, condense both uh, cases, then you would actually have this. Right? So if this situation here occurs, and if this situation is non-zero, so if this R prime is non-zero, and actually would have an arbitrage opportunity. It actually also turns out, if you look at the book by Alinsky, and that's very, very beautiful, I really think it's so beautiful, this thing, that this I star is also linked to some curvature. So the curvature of a manifold actually, in this case, also would give you kind of an indicator of the degree of arbitrage. 
very beautiful. It's also done within the context of fiber bundles. Uh, and he explains this very, very well on how fiber bundles could actually have, uh, could be used within a financial context. But he also defines this action function here in this way. And I think that's very, very nice because connecting this action function in this way connects also that ID of action function uh, with arbitrage. So under no arbitrage here, this would actually have to be zero. Right. You could also write this in a continuous time, and then that's what you get, and what you see, what we actually discussed slightly this morning. Right? You, you recognize what we have here, right? Because we have, right? This is our expected return. Right? So you could also rewrite this action function in the same way here. Right? And again, capture arbitrage with it, depending on whether this is zero or not. So here is another example. Oh, what what is this? Okay, yeah, no. right. So, um, right. I wanted to say a little bit more about information, but unfortunately, we have this problem with this uh, stupid copyright thing, um, especially this relationship between uh, Fisher information and the quantum potential. Um, which is work which was actually developed by probably a colleague of yours, uh, Professor Reginato. Reginato. I don't know. I, I don't remember which university he belongs to. <laughs> Reginato. I'm sorry, okay. So <laughs> pronounce, pronouncement wrong, okay. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yes, absolutely, yeah. And he comes from Iran. Okay, uh, okay. I, I now have to remember in which uh, journal he published paper, but it's a very nice result he has. But I must tell you in advance, in that paper he shows that the average quantum potential is proportional to Fisher information. Now, of course, I like that a lot because Fisher information is very easily linkable to finance and economics. For instance, uh, those people here, Hawkins and Frieden, <laughs> have come up with a uh, very uh, interesting interpretation of it. And of course, uh, since of course we want to do something with this quantum potential from financial point of view, it is quite interesting result, I think. But uh, when I showed that, re uh, that result by in this paper to uh, Basel, Basel did not know, uh, had not heard of it. So I'm not so sure whether we really <laughs> can be very positive about this type of result. But um, so I think I, I mean, I wanted to say much more about this information business, but I think we cannot do that because of this uh, filming stuff. Um, so my uh, final message is really that I think um, uh, that if, if, if we can somehow expand uh, our uh, workings on trying to coax this idea of no arbitrage uh, with maybe action functionals or with this idea of using information functions and expand upon that and, and get really interesting results, then I think we can really do something in finance with it. At this point, of course, we have not really interesting results. We are just trying to connect some things and see if there's anything we can do with it, but in fact, we have no results as such. But I think if we can continue on to, to this path, I think there are things which we can do. It's a very good point of attack within uh, asset pricing to look at uh, no arbitrage and to revolve around that concept. So again, I can uh, send you all those slides with the references and so on, but uh, I won't be able to do it today. So uh, Andrea, I think that's what I wanted to say. So <clears throat> that's fine. Let's thank Professor Haven for the, for a nice discussion. And uh, actually, we do have two, well, two or more possibilities. The, the first possibility is okay. Already starting with, with questions directly on on this side of the talk, uh, then there should be something like uh, an uncertain thing, which is if uh, Professor Trueblood could join us for a brief webinar. And I, I will find out in the meantime as you ask question to Professor Haven. If not, and the, and if you like, we could also say in uh, that switched off. At switched off cameras, maybe we could also further comment about this, uh, this relationship with Fisher information. So, starting with the first thing, who, who wants to start with some questions about this, uh, about this topic? You are starting, okay. Uh, yes. 
I don't know all these uh, <laughs> kind of problems and topics, of course. I was uh, wondering from the very beginning about uh, contextuality, because it is a big problem in physics, of course, because it implies a, a simultaneous action, action at a distance and all that. While it seems to me that in this framework it can be resource, something more in, in some sense, in, 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 from the economical, the financial interpretation of uh, uh, bombs, wave, uh, guide wave, and so on, it could be something like a resource, an informational interpretation. Uh -huh. Because uh, you have, in some sense, information which is far away, which influences what is happening here and there. You're talking about uh, Yes, okay. about... Okay. Not, is it, well, it is a form of contextuality. That is a contextuality at a distance, you know. Yes. I was wondering whether uh, you considered this kind of problems. Thank you very much. Um, can I shoot back a question? And, and should one be concerned about non-locality? Should one be should we be should one be concerned about non-locality within Bohemian because Bohemian yeah, non is non-local. Yeah. Is non -local. Yes, it's yes, and yes. And yes. Non yes. yes. But should but should it is a kind of yeah. Yes, yes. But this is a problem in physics. Yeah, yeah. Why is it? Would be, it is not a problem. But that's, that's what I wonder. I've always, a bit, I've always been a bit worried about the fact that you have non-locality which you kind of transplant within this financial environment. And I've always been a bit worried about that because... Uh, but, but you would not be worried about that in terms of... Uh, because, of course, technically speaking, of course, it's not true, right? I mean, in, in yeah. financial, I mean it's not possible, yeah, right? So. No. There is some short time, but the environment uh, determines what is happens in the point. So, uh, considering this just as a model and uh, um, and the spontaneous action, the distance, yeah. being actually uh, uh, just a model for an action which is very quick. Aha, uh -huh, I see. So you would and not be uh -huh. the context would affect. It's not, I don't think it's even working. I mean, oh, it yes. is working, but I think you have to hold it. Very is it low. working? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, of course, yes. So yeah, just as a wrong position. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, maybe it is a very naive question. I don't no, know. no, I, I, I like it very much, actually, because I think one of the comments I always get when we present this is, oh, yeah, but booming mechanics is non-local. What the heck are you going to do with this now? Because you know the real world. Yes, yes. But, but uh, it's nice to hear what you are saying, that maybe you could temper that a little bit. Yes. You could temper you, you, this down. You have, uh, all, uh, often we have in physics uh, models with step function, but actually you think that they are not so... Uh, now, we, you have some influence at a distance, uh, but this, of course, in, on the heart yeah. at a very quick, mm -hmm. and it is information goes yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, here and there yeah. very quickly. But, yeah. uh, but so of course, it's not as quickly as what would be. So you can think that uh, uh, there is not actual non-locality or actual contextuality, but something no. which mm -hmm. looks like in the model, just in the model. And in this sense, it is uh, reasonable yeah. mm -hmm. because uh, the global information affects what it happens yeah. here and there. Yes, and it is also to answer the question to some extent, because I will not be able to answer the question to, uh, mm. to the extent to which I should be trying to answer it, uh, because I don't have really the knowledge to do it, but uh, okay. I will also give you Sandro as a response. Yes. Yes, but yes. of course, it's true that within financial uh, environment, uh, what we were also were discussing this morning, you can actually look at information exchanges which are extremely fast. Right? Yes, 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 yes. The yes, argument yes. this morning we had is that in fact now they are looking at locations to uh, yes. data transmissions so that the uh, fiber speed is extremely yes. optimal for uh, the network of, yes. of, of uh, in this financial centers. Yes. Yeah. In this perspective you could look at that just as a But it is of course not instantaneous. That's yes, of yes. Course, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. No, this is an interesting aspect because uh, typically one uh, 
when one uh, talks about the possibility of applying uh, quantum structures well, outside the microscopic world uh, of uh, quantum physics, uh, one does not take into account uh, the possibility of having non-locality. Okay. One of these aspects is, uh, is contextuality, and another one is emergence and uh, uh, uncertainty or, uh, or entanglement, but not, not non-locality. But uh, this, this would be interesting with respect to the, uh, to the efficiency of the market, the hypothesis of uh, uh, a efficient market which underlies uh, the black scholes merton model of option pricing in in which sense typically you assume uh, th this is what we discussed this morning so uh, the idea is that if you assume uh, a random a random walk hypothesis uh, which is at the basis of uh, black scholes uh, model of option pricing this is consistent compatible with the assumption of a, a perfectly efficient market so the information is spread locally and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Now, uh, this works in stable conditions. So wh where, when you don't have market crash, when you don't have financial crisis. On the contrary, when you have situations of this kind, uh, you have uh, a, a typical situation when information is spread non-locally. Because you have information uh, and the news of a world importance that are uh, transmitted. And in this period, after 2008, this is what had actually occurred. So this is a way, by using uh, a non-local potential with respect to the interpretation of information that is, uh, is transferred, this could be a way to represent the situations of this kind. Why not? You know, if information is encoded into the wave function and it is influenced by a non-local potential, you can have the possibility of transmitting non-locally information. So you can, your formalism, I'm saying, your formalism is theoretically capable of uh, uh, capturing situations of this kind. Thank you very much, Sandro. Very interesting what you say, but I'm just slightly worried that, of course, before crash, uh, this degree of non-locality, if I may call it like that, is already present also. So do, are you saying, so do, do, you, do you say that you want to modulate the degree of non-locality? Yes, yes, in this case. So it plays a role. I, I'm not saying that this quantum potential uh, is, is always present. In, su in such a situation. I'm just saying that it could play a role in particular in those situations where you are financial crisis or something of this kind. By modulating your degree, if, if that exists. Yes, yes. Now I don't know uh, in which sense you have to interpret a non-locality uh, that is present in Bohmian mechanics. I don't know, Claudio, I, I don't know whether this, this is the same non-locality that, that is present, for example, in uh, in quantum physics, in microscopic quantum physics, I, I you know that the interpretation is is slightly different. Yeah, of course, of you, course. You, you have a little form of, of realism in Bohmian mechanics, which is not present in the standard interpretation. Yes, of course. But uh, I, I saw no locality just oh, yes. I was thinking of, of no locality just as a simplification in the model not an actual non-locality, as it occurs in physics, where it is a problem, but just as a, a form of simplification for having a mathematical model, yes. just in this sense. Yes. No, no, we disagree, Emmanuel. This is an interesting aspect. The possibility of having, uh, of, uh, having something that non-locally influences information. Sorry, what I was saying is that you have to be careful of the language uh, uh, because when physicists hear that, they will immediately think of non-locality as something that's happening with superluminal speed, which is of course not what you mean. Yeah, what what you are meaning is yeah, is entanglement in a certain sense, uh, and and I think that in that case you can call it entanglement. Uh, uh, but uh, what what you are really talking about is this uh, uh, contextual dependence of those variables. So something that changed here is contextually influencing so, uh, something elsewhere. Uh, 
right? So of course, if I look at, for example, the uh, uh, stock prices of, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, a certain company in the U.S. stock market, uh, that company's stock price is going to be influenced by what happened at the uh, Japanese stock market uh, uh, if they have overlapping time. I don't know if they have, do they have overlapping no, they times? Have, the, the certain banks have uh, loans which are open. Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah so, so whatever happens in Japan is going to be influencing what happens in the U.S. So no and it's, yeah, uh, which, which of course is going to make it highly contextual. But um, when we're thinking about non-locality, we're thinking about something happening in Japan and influencing something in the U.S. before there is time for a classical signal to be sent from Japan to the U.S. That's not what you mean. But that's so, why we wanted to yeah. go back to the professor to see if we can kind yeah. of temper that down, but I don't know as much. When it's closed, when, when, when it's well, the, 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 the price is set by the transaction, right? So the question is the period between the two transactions. Um, I don't know. You, you, uh, Emmanuel can tell me about that. But uh, 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 you can't have, if you have correlations that happen in the period between two transactions, and those transactions happen in a uh, 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 time-like separated uh, 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 sort of event, um, like I'm, I'm sure it can happen, right? Because uh, uh, those transactions happen within milliseconds, and the time for a, a classical signal should be transmitted from uh, Tokyo to the US using the uh, communication devices that we have might be uh, greater than just one millisecond or something like that. It needs to go to satellites and come back. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, if you find such correlations, I would be extremely surprised and uh, puzzled. Uh, Anybody? Andrea, I think maybe you want to connect to uh, California. Okay, yeah, I'm already trying. So uh, I could suggest let's make something like five minutes pause, and in the meantime, I will try to 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 fix up the the Skype call with uh, with Professor Trueblood. If I do not succeed, then we will conclude the session for today after just after this nice talk, and say in in any or maybe there will be some uh, some time left for one-to-one -one discussions with Professor Haven. And I will thank him uh, once again for, for both answering the questions and giving the talk. And thanks everybody for attending up to now.